Welcome to Story Comic Presents, where we interview amazing storytellers and artists. This is episode 276. I'm your host, Barney Smith of StoryComic.com, and we're honored to have with us the award-winning and acclaimed author of You Were Always There, Stephen Russell Payne. Hello, Barney. Nice to see you. Yeah, it's nice to see you, too. You're welcome. So you... You've had a lot of books. You've written, I believe, six books so far, correct? Since since uh, 2011. Yeah, one was before that. Five since 2011 that are available. Right. And one really old poetry collection you'll never find. <laughs> is that on purpose, or is that is that just because of just how it happened? Yeah, it's just how it happens. That was from way back in my Tufts University days. Okay. And so you recently just said this was book just came out um, last September. You were always there. Correct. And, and so has this, so I'm really curious about, is this connected at all to cliff walking and life on a cliff, or is this a completely separate story to the other ones? This is a completely separate story. Those two novels, um, cliff walking and the sequel life on a cliff are set on the coast of Maine. Right. And You Were Always There is set around beautiful Caspian Lake in Greensboro in the night starts in 1970. And it's a completely separate story. Actually, it's my first Vermont based novel, um, right. which has been a lot of fun because I, I know that area pretty well. And uh, the book has really taken off. It's been great. Before we really jump into talking about that, so I'm really curious about how you, when you first started writing, as you said, cliff walking, you've done a second edition to it. And is the second edition different than your original edition from 2011? Well, when I decided to do the sequel, I actually had a lot of um, book group discussions. People were hounding me about what happens next. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know the answer to that. And I decided that um, I really ought to write a sequel. Um, so I did. And when the book designer designed the new book, which was a different size than the original Cliff Walking, we decided to re-edit it and have okay. a very similar cover, similar size. And booksellers really want the six by nine and they kind of like your name and, and the frontage, you know, to be kind of similar, um, especially if you're doing a sequel. So that was really why the second edition came out. And it's been really nice because um, people tend to read both and booksellers, you know, like presenting both. So that's that's really how that came about. Okay. And so how... So because of doing the second edition, as you mentioned, there's a little bit of re-editing to it. Were you able to like really kind of highlight some of the things you mentioned in a previous interview that, you know, there's um, every book that is ever published is always going to have a typo in it. Was this kind of like your second chance to just say, oh, I wish I, I really wanted to change this section. Or I really wanted to change that. But were you able to go back in and, and make some of those changes too? Yeah, the answer is yes. Um, fortunately, there were only actually two typos in the whole book. But oh, wow. I took some of the feedback from book groups that I'd done uh, that I thought had some really good points. And several people mentioned the same issue two or three times. And I thought, well, if I'm going to do another edition, I'm going to go back and rethink the, that particular issue. And I think it made it a better story basically. Okay. Okay. Oh, and, and so what were some of the things that you mentioned for that, that sequel now is, is life on a cliff. If, have you wrapped up all the loose ends or have you deliberately left some things open in case there's going to be a uh, making this into a trilogy series? Well, that's a great, <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question. Um, in, in the middle of all this, I wrote a musician's biography of Rick Norcross, of Rick and the Ramblers. And right. 
that unexpectedly really took off. And I ended up kind of touring with the band with different <laughs> bookstores. And that kind of pushed my short story collection off um, ties that bind us. So I had a lot going on and I was still working full time as a surgeon. So, you know, trying to juggle all of this. So, and I really wanted to write, uh, you were always there. So the long and short answer is, I don't know if there's going to be um, a third book in, in the Cliff series. Um, I've had a lot of requests for it. I left um, on quite a few characters still alive. <laughs> <laughs> so they can, they can do other things. Um, but honestly, I've been so busy the last uh, couple of years finishing um, You Were Always There and, and now touring with it that I, I really haven't given the Cliff series a lot, a lot of thought recently. Right. But I will revisit it uh, maybe. Does does your does your other book does this actually all kind of take place in the same like universe in that sense? Yeah, the the two okay. novels in Maine take place in a fictitious coastal town called Winter's Cove um, that I made up, but it's you know in the Rockland Camden area, and there's a lot of identification uh, with that area that people you know recognize, um, right. but. All the characters, uh, except a couple of famous people who are mentioned, like Andrew Wyeth uh, in the first book, um, are all came out of my head, um, mm. which can be a scary neighborhood at times. <laughs> but what, did you say as you were as you were writing, you were always there? Did you have like in your creative mind that it takes place in the same, you know, like Stephen Russell Payne world as as your Cliff series? Yeah, I think my voice, as Howard Mosier would say, is pretty similar. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm fairly easy to read, even though I deal with a lot of pretty deep issues. Um, right. I do not want readers to have to have a crowbar to get through my book. And I don't want them having to look up words every three pages. That's, that's not the way I write. I think I write on a pretty deep emotional level, um, but my voice has stayed pretty similar, I think. Mm. And, yeah. you know, I've been writing long enough now. I, I think I'm kind of stuck in my voice anyway. No, do you see, because you you just mentioned that like a, you were always there was a book that you wanted to write for a long time. Have you noticed because you have four or five books already written and published since your first thought of writing this book that you, the book is better for it because of all the things that you, all the experience you have in writing other books already? Yes. I, and that's a really good point. It, it's kind of an interesting little story. Um, I started, you were always there 15 years ago and I wrote about four chapters. I sent them to Howard Mosier, who is a dear friend and mentor Mm -hmm. And Howard loved it. He said, you know, this is great. You've got to keep going. And I literally ran out of gas. I didn't, I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I shifted gears and I wrote the whole book of Life on a Cliff. Right. <laughs> and, and worked on the Rick book, etc. And it was really interesting when, when I got to a certain point in, in the early days of You Were Always There, Life on a Cliff just came to me. And, and I, wow. wrote the, okay. I wrote the whole book. I, and I can't really explain to you what triggered it. Um, but when I finished Life on a Cliff, um, Luke and Sarah, the main characters in You Were Always There, just reappeared in my head. And I, I tend to see a whole story arc almost at once. It, it, wow. I, you know, I have a pretty good idea from the beginning where the story is going to start and where it's going to end up. I don't really know what's going to happen per se, you know, in the meantime, but um, I do have a pretty complete vision um, of, of where the story arc is going to go. And thankfully, when I went back to You Were Always There, it 
it just roared. I mean, I, I, I wrote, I wrote every day pretty much for about 20 months. As, as the story was going through, as they say, are you a plotzer or are you a pantser? How would you describe your writing style? I don't, I don't know if I'm either of those. <laughs> yeah, I love the pantser term. Um, I used to put up on the wall kind of an outline. Okay. And maybe that helped. Like my wife says, if you write a grocery list, you're less likely to forget things, even though I still forget them. <laughs> and the truth is, I never looked at the wall again. <laughs> it was up there, but um, I had where I was going, you know, really in my head. And I, I spend a lot of time thinking about the stories. I, I try not to watch a lot of news. I don't have the radio on in my truck a lot. Um, my poor kids, when they were little, would take yellow sticky notes for me while I was driving <laughs> and stick them on the dashboard. I could barely <laughs> see the speedometer. I mean, it was like crazy. Um, so, you know, when I'm starting a story and, and I'm feeling it, um, I, I guess I'm kind of running by the seat of my pants, but it's it's very intentional. Like, I, I know where I'm going. I don't know exactly what's going to happen. But, you know, and particularly in this story, which takes place over decades wow. with a somewhat complicated cast of characters, um, you know, I'll, there's times where I go to bed with a headache because I'm trying to keep everybody straight and their voice straight and what they, you know, what they've done before. So it makes sense. And it, it's a real adventure. Right. And, you know, I mean, it's kind of a wild enterprise writing a book. <laughs> and so, and so in that case, do you see yourself, there are times when as you're writing out the manuscript for, um, for the book that the characters seem to go in a direction that you weren't planning on. And you're like, well, this is where we're going. I'm not sure where we're going, but we're going to go this way. Or are you basically steering the ship to say, no, this is where we need to go. I think it's a combination. There are okay. definite things and scenes that I want and I need to happen. But mm -hmm. once I get the character or the characters into that scene, um, they really do kind of take on their own life. And sometimes I feel like I'm just writing it down. You know, I can barely keep up with, you know, with, with what's going on. Um, there's a love scene in this new book and, and love scenes are, it's funny, a lot of people who don't write think love scenes are really easy and really fun to write. And they're actually extremely difficult. They're, they're, mm. It's a lot of work to, to write a love scene. And, um, you know, without getting into any details and spoiling it, um, the, the love scene occurs um, in an old horse barn hayloft. And once I got them in there, which was about two in the morning, my time, <laughs> um, I just kind of let, you know, watched. I, I kind of let what ha was going to happen happen. And the characters right. were developed enough then that, you know, it sounds kind of funny, but like they knew what to do. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and that's exciting. Like, you know, when characters have become real enough to me um, that they're doing their own thing, it kind of heralds to me that this is going to work for the reader. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the verisimilitude is is good. It's happening. Right. Yeah. Um, and so how... So, so once you put it in, how, how long did it take you to write from, you know, as you mentioned, you started doing it like 15 years ago, but when you actually like got down and actually started working on this, how long did the entire process take? Once I first, really, the first got, draft? really got cooking, it was a little over a year and a half or almost okay. two years to get a decent first draft. And once I have that, I, it goes to my content editor, uh, Leslie Kellis Payne, no relation, okay. but she's a legendary editor out in Fresno, California. She goes through it and it comes back to me and I rewrite it. And then it goes to my wife, who's a great first reader. We, we kind of put our, 
our mar long-term marriage on hold. <laughs> and But she's a great editor. And then I go through the book again. And then I have three other first readers. And actually, Phyllis Mosier, Howard's widow, did an edit for me, which was great on this book. Wow. So once I go through all of those, we're now about three years into the process. But by the time I get there, the book is getting fairly polished. And, mm. you know, by then I, I meet with the book designer. And I, I think it was about three and a half years ish before I had the book in my hand, if you will. Mm. And and so was there any any parts during that process where um, was it mostly line editing or was it more developmental editing that they they did for you? Um, my California editor does more, con, you know, concept um, okay. sort of editing. She, I mean, if I've done something ridiculous, <laughs> you know, <laughs> she'll point it out to me. And then um, it's very interesting. These four women that are great readers, um, I take all of their input and they're really great. I mean, they do line yeah. editing, concept editing, the whole thing. And if two of them, have a problem with something, I know it's got to be worked on. That's okay. kind of my rule. Right. You know, if one person has a problem, it's often, you know, kind of their opinion. It's their style of what they like. Right. Um, and then, then it goes to the copy editor, who's a wonderful woman in uh, Cambridge, Vermont, very talented. Yeah. And then I, I did another whole rewrite. And then finally, when I think the book is is really polished, it goes to the copyright. I'm sorry, the copy editor. Um, sorry, the proofreader. Okay. And she she's so good, but so brutal. <laughs> I thought the book was almost per perfect, and I had over 300 cor little corrections to do. <laughs> 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 and, you know, by then you're in a way you kind of love your book, but you're so sick of it. You want to, you know, throw it out the right. window. kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> How thick of a skin do you have to have as an author when you send that out for those proofreads? Well, there, there's a couple of things I would say. I'm actually editing or co-writing a famous musician's memoir at the moment. Mm. I'm having a really hard time convincing him that first drafts are usually pretty bad. Um, people who, who have not written much or never written a book before have this concept often that they, they can't stop writing a chapter till it's, you know, perfect. They can't stop working on a first draft till it's perfect. And of course, any of us who've been in the writing trenches know that's not the way it is, you know, at all. Um, one of my friends, Jenny, Jennifer Finney Boylan, who actually has a New York Times bestseller at the moment, uh, Jody Pico, says the first draft of anything is dreck that you throw against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, as you get better at writing, it's not really quite that bad. But my first piece of advice when I do seminars and things is, you know, let yourself go. Put everything, including the kitchen sink, into your first draft because you never know what you're going to keep. You never know where you're going to go and get away from this idea that, you know, you're going to write perfectly. If Stephen King can't write perfectly in a first draft, you know, we're certainly not going to. <laughs> and, you know, I really think that's important. You've just got to let yourself go and you know, just kind of write the story and not worry about punctuation or anything else. And mm -hmm. that's been really helpful for me. Stephen King also in his book on writing, which is a great book if people haven't read it, talks about keeping his study door closed till he gets a first draft done. And that has been my process. I don't talk about anything to do with the book, even to my wife. She has no idea what I'm working on at the moment. And the concept is that I want all of my creative energy to go onto the page. I don't want it to go 
to somebody online or on Facebook or down the street. I, I try to harness all of my creative energy and get it onto the page for the first draft. Mm. And then I'm so appreciative of my first readers. And over the years, I don't, I don't mind anything they have to say. I did have one, <laughs> a short story once that, that one of my first readers wrote me back and he said, the only comment I have about this story is I would hit delete. <laughs> so I took mild offense to that, but, but I got over it. Right. But outside yeah. of that, I think we have to appreciate the effort that, that friends or readers or whoever put into helping us make a story better. And, and mm. I, even if I disagree with them, even if, you know, they think one of my favorite passages is ridiculous, I, I, I truly appreciate them and try to incorporate, um, you know, what they've had to say, particularly of two of them. So I don't think it's thick skin. I think it's gratitude, you know, coming from a place of gratitude for right. people who are willing to, to help you make a story better. What have you learned about yourself from this latest book that you wrote? Interesting question. Um, I've had this dual career my whole life, um, right. being a surgeon and, you know, a husband and a dad and, and a writer. And I was very fortunate that my chief of surgery, John Davis, at, at UVM was, was a man of letters and an editor of the Journal of Trauma, et cetera. So he really encouraged me to, you know, keep going, if you will, you know, with my writing. And I think one of the things that I've learned is that if I want to be a serious writer, if I want to publish, if I want other people to be able to read my stories, I had to take the same serious commitment to my writing that I took to my surgical career. Mm -hmm. I, actually, I actually gave a, an address to the American College of Surgeons um, Vermont uh, chapter a few years ago in Stowe. And one of my colleagues, after I gave the talk, said, you know, how in the world do you do both? You know, how do you write and do surgery, et cetera? And I had to think about it for a minute, but my answer was what I just referred to, which is if I'm going to be a writer, I have to be as serious and committed to that as I am to being a dad, a husband, a surgeon, or whatever, it can't be, for me, it can't be some mamby-pamby sideline that I do when the muse is on my shoulder, I'm in the right mood, or the moons line up. None of that means anything. Right. You know, if I want to be a writer, I've got to show up to my pad, my computer, whatever it is, and you know, I need to dedicate a significant amount of time um, to the story and, and try to get the story, you know, as, as good as I can. Um, I've, I think I've never done a book event, and I've done hundreds of them, where at least one person hasn't come up to me and said, quote, you know, Steve, I want to be a writer. You know, how do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you don't, you don't laugh, you try to help them. But one of the messages right. is, if you've got some passion, and you've got some interest that you want to write about in, you need to start dedicating one, two, three hours a day to learning about the craft of writing and then practicing it, you know, because it's, it's serious business. Let's talk a little bit about You Were Always There, your your latest novel. What are some of the things that, that your previous readers of your other books, what do you hope that they can get out of this? And, and what are some of your, your new readers that hope, you hope to get out of this? I think all of my stories are love stories in one form or another. You know, they're, they're mm -hmm. not trashy romance at all. But, you know, Howard Mosier always said the best stories are always love stories. And, and I kind of believe that. And they come in all kinds of types. This story uh, set in 1970 is about a farm kid, Luke Sims, who has a low um, draft number. The Vietnam War is raging. And he just graduated from high school and is waiting for his military induction notice. 
and he lives on the outskirts of town in kind of a dilapidated farmhouse with his very ill mother, who he takes care of. And he's working for the Black River Sawmill, de delivering posts and beams. And one Saturday, he delivers a load down to Caspian Lake, where a fancy um, lake home is being built. And on the hood, the warm hood of a 68 Mustang convertible, cherry red, by the way, is a beautiful blonde woman who happens to be the um, judge's daughter. And the judge is the powerful federal judge who's building this cabin on Caspian Lake. And he kind of glances over at her, gets his truck stuck. And really, the two of them, their lives are never the same after they meet. They come from completely different worlds, but they're both really good people, kind of in different ways. And so the love story is really spans the rest of their lives, if you will. And it goes from Vermont to Vietnam and back again. There's a cast of characters um, that really give you a feel of a Vermont community. Greensboro is, is the town, which is a real town. You can even visit Willie's store in the book, um, which some people may know. And my idea of the book was to really draw you into these two characters and the environment so that you really care about them. And in the many events I've done um, so far, it's really interesting. Most of the events I go to, people tell me they were in tears, you know, reading wow. the book, particularly at the end. And it's not that I set out to dehydrate readers, <laughs> <laughs> but when people have, a, you know, strong emotions about a book, it means they care about the characters. You know, they're... Right. They're into the story. They've suspended their disbelief, as we say. And I, I feel really good about that. You know, this, this story takes you on a journey through the eyes of, of these two main characters, as well as, you know, a host of other characters. And I think there's similarities to my other story or the other two novels set up on the coast of Maine, which are also love stories, different love stories. But the idea of hoping you're going to bond with these characters and really care about what happens to them uh, is, is really what's behind, you know, what I do. And, and I think that really worked with Cliff Walking and Life on a Cliff. Or frankly, I never would have gotten the feedback from Cliff Walking that led me to write a sequel. Mm. I mean, people would get angry with me at book groups, you know, like wanting to know when the sequel was coming out and I hadn't even started. <laughs> so, you know, as an author, you love that, you know, that, right. That people care. Right. So how do you see, uh, how do you see publishing since you started back in 2011, 12 years later, how, how has the, how is the world of publishing and, and authorship? How is that, um, evolved over the past 12 years? Wow. Tremendously. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of sharpened my teeth with Tom Slayton at Vermont Life. <clears throat> I wrote for Vermont Life for many years. And of course, unfortunately, Vermont Life is gone, but that was right. a great place for me to, you know, work with a really good editor, including John Lazenby. And um, I, I miss some of those great periodicals like Vermont Life, which unfortunately is is no longer. I think the publishing industry, you know, it used to be you really couldn't publish if you didn't get through the slush pile on some agent's desk and, you know, you had a one in 10,000 chance of an editor somewhere picking you up and there were, you know, six major companies that controlled everything. And when the internet really exploded and independent publishing um, really started to blossom. The whole world changed. Um, in right. fact, some of my friends and, you know, famous authors that I know, um, they don't, they publish them on their own independently now. They, they, you know, I mean, for them, they were making a living at 
you know, getting 96 cents, you know, per book and they went out on their own and they're getting $4 a book, you know, it was kind of survival. And the other thing, I think social media, and I'm certainly not a guru, I do a fair amount on Facebook, um, which has been great for for my events and, and my readers, has social media has allowed anybody to get the word out and to connect with people. You don't have to have, you know, a major publisher sending out broadsides uh, of your book anymore. I'm not even sure they do that anymore. (laughs) And ironically, you know, Howard Moser used to talk about, he did a, he did a hundred stop book tour on one of his later books. And Maybe he was joking, but he said his publisher wouldn't even pay for the gas. Wow. <laughs> now, I'm not exactly sure that's true, right. but but you get the point. So right. with social media, all of us, particularly once you get a following, um, you can communicate with your readers and with reader groups and, and um, you know, do things like this, you know, where, right. where people, the, the message gets out. And, you know, I will say, do you know doing things pretty much independently even though i have a great team you you know it's a lot of work i mean you have to really learn the business if you will of you know helping people find your books and getting events and uh, i remember when cliff walking came out i met mike desanto and uh, renee who owned uh, phoenix books and Mike and I still laugh about him raking me over the coals before he finally said he would do an event. And, you know, I I did my first book launch there and I did my last fall. I did You Were Always There, like to a packed house, you know, to a bookstore that's been incredibly supportive. And, you know, it feels wonderful, you know, to be able to build an audience. I mean, I'm still you know, trying to build a bigger national audience. Um, But, you know, it's coming. I mean, you just kind of keep at it. Um, So it's it's a whole different landscape than it was 10, 15 years ago. Because right now, as well as you just mentioned, Stephen, that you've you've won awards already. And at what point do you, is is there a, a twinge of fear in the sense that you're thinking that, that you, might be directed more towards writing books that you think are going to sell as compared to passion projects of, of stories that you want to tell? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think the answer to that is no, Mm -hmm. that I, I have this voice and I have these stories in my head or that come into my head and, you know, while, of course, I want people to read them, I hmm. I really never sit there and go, hmm, you know, if I take this road, am I going to get 100 more readers? And if I right. take another road, I'll get 1,000 more. I just don't think like that, okay. you know, really at all. Um, I'm on Chapter 23 of, an, of another new novel um, set around uh, um, Addison County in Vermont, completely different than the other ones. Right. And you know, well, I mean, a, Addison County is completely different than the Northeast Kingdom. We all boy, know is it ever! <laughs> <laughs> Although there's no Snake Mountain up in the Northeast Kingdom, that's true. <laughs> um, and and maybe I even avoid that that type of thinking. Um, right. You know, Howard always said, you know, you you can only write your stories. You you can't pretend to write something else. Um, you, you've got to write your stories. That's not to say you don't want to get better and better at, at doing it. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I feel blessed. My readers love my stories. And, you know, I, I, I'm not going to kind of do something really different just because maybe another slice of, of readership will come to me. I, I don't know. I just can't think like that. Right. So, so Stephen, if people want to learn more about your work in, in your books, where is the best place they could go to? Well, my website is www.stephenrusselpain.com. Okay. Anybody can contact me through my website, my emails there, whatever. Um, right. 
And I, I thoroughly enjoy, um, I mean, I've gotten chewed out at these sessions. <laughs> <laughs> So listen, so Stephen, you're gonna to have to come back on then when you got your second book when you got your next book coming out. Then we'll talk about well, it. I I appreciate that. I I am really kind of dually focused on promoting. You are always there, um, okay. but I am working on uh, the new book, uh, which I'm excited about, and I'm also editing slash co-writing this memoir of of this other friend of mine. So there's several irons in the fire. And and yeah. the other thing I just wanted to mention is there's a great organization called the League of Vermont Writers. Right, and yeah. it's been around for like 100 years or something. Um, we're having our um, usually annual retreat up at Jerry Johnson's farmhouse in Albany. Um, yeah. I think it's like the 15th of July, that, that Saturday. It's a wonderful gathering. It's called Into the Words where all kinds of readers and authors get together. I'm actually giving a, a talk on discipline. <laughs> oh, I need to take my own advice, of course. Um, but for, for writers out there, writers and readers, um, it, it costs like next to nothing to join the League of Vermont Writers. And it's a really active group that is very helpful um, particularly for people who are trying to learn how to write. Right. Yeah, that's a, yeah, I know about them. Yeah. There's a, there's a, a lot of great writers and folks in that group. Yeah. yeah. That group's been around, I mean, literally like 90 or a hundred years or something. Right. It's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, 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 thank you so much, Stephen. It was such a, it was a genuine pleasure getting a chance to chat with you. Well, Barney, thank you so much. You know, I love doing this sort of thing. And, you know, if it brings in some new readers or I meet people on the road that saw the, the podcast, it's it's fun. It's great. Yeah. yeah, perfect. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a good evening. And and so do you what we're I, know, I gotta timestamp this. I had it's like what I what I love about this, Stephen, is that like, you know, this is the the live piece, but then then I, I pull it and then I just like edit it and then and it seems as though when I ask the questions, I'm like one after the other, and people are thinking, Wow, look at Barney's asking so many. It's all editing. I mean, it's yeah, I'm just that's all it is. <laughs>